And I sat next to him and I just talked and he never said a word to me. Uh, and then a few minutes later, I just left. So I went to maybe 15 minutes And um, the nurse who had admitted him was standing outside the door and she said, I can't believe that. That has never happened. Because okay? every time he had contact, he had attacked the person. Okay? And there was a brand new staff person. This guy was 19 years old. He just finished his training, new on the job, had no experience at all. And he said, well, that's nothing. And he just walked in and did the same thing. And he didn't do the relaxation stuff, but he sat and talked to the guy and, and stayed longer than I did and had no problem whatsoever. And he put his finger exactly on what happened and what worked. And that was nothing. Walking in there with nothing. Okay? For 30 years, every human contact that this man had, people came in expecting a fight. And he gave it to him. He gave it to him big time. And it was never one person alone, it was a group of people coming in expecting a fight. Okay? All of a sudden, in one day, two people walk in, neither one expecting a fight, and he doesn't fight. Okay? I wound up seeing the guy just a few more times myself, and the staff person established a real good relationship with him. And he stayed there a month or so, and they sent him back to his other facility. And I happened to um, be there for another reason about a year later, and they still had him in the seclusion room, but they'd taken the lock off the seclusion room. Just a matter of someone letting go of their preconceptions and trying to understand where he was going. Simple as that. And that did pretty worse. And it didn't do it. It's still had a lot of problems. But in terms of the bottom of the direction, So understanding means letting go. Okay? We can't go with all of our preconceptions and our prejudices and our ideas about what should be. It means letting go. And to see another person's reality as much as we can through their eyes. I'm letting that make sense. I'm going to read a quote to you from uh, Vaclav Havel, who's the president of the Czech Republic, one of my favorite politicians. We have to abandon the arrogant belief that the world is merely a puzzle to be solved, a machine with instructions for use waiting to be discovered, a body of information to be fed into a computer in the hope that sooner or later will spit out a universal solution. We have to release from the sphere of private whim such forces of a natural, unique, and unrepeatable experience of the world, an elementary sense of justice, the ability to see things as others do. We must try harder to understand than to explain. The way forward is not in the mere construction of a universal systemic solution to be applied to reality from the outside. It is also in the seeking to get the heart get to the heart of reality through personal experiences. In order to understand, then we can call it. Any questions about understanding? Share is the next step. As we move through these steps, we also, the common denominator is it's human to human. So we need to share our humanity. We need to share our mistakes ask for forgiveness when we make mistakes. Uh, when we share what we hold in common, then we can build a bond. And if you really look at it, we have more in common with most people than the ways we are different. We can be totally different in terms of education, in terms of background, in terms of history, even in terms of language and culture, but you find that we really share more than how we're different. Even if you're with someone from a totally different country and culture. Okay. Wonderful experiences with people where we didn't even share the same language and couldn't communicate. When we spent days together and had fun and had a lot in common that we be able to talk about. Um, we need to share our limitations and our weaknesses. Our tendency is to try to cover up our limitations and weaknesses. We don't want people to see it. We're going to judge us on it. Okay? But it's somewhat simpler if we share that and are open about that and focus on improving them rather than trying to cover up. We never improve anything when we cover up. When we share our feelings, it makes it safer and more comfortable for other people to share their feelings and to experience their feelings and their own emotions. Okay? When we share our gifts, it helps other people to grow and to develop. It helps us grow and develop in our own gifts, too. It builds a sense of togetherness, okay? and it helps to melt away the isolation. People feel connected when a helper shares with them. Okay? And it also helps us to realize our own potential. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you, you go and, and say, uh, yeah, boy, I had a little bit of an argument with my wife last night, and you know, hear all of this. 
that's not helpful. Okay? They don't need to hear about my problems. Okay? But in terms of sharing my experiences that are similar to theirs, or sharing my feelings or my reaction, or my basic humanness, in this situation where we're together, okay, that's what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about. Um, because that's developing a friendship, which you may choose to do at some point, um, but that's different than a healthy relationship. Then it becomes a mutual healthy relationship. Okay? And to be a really effective helper, your own needs uh, get met also. Okay? And if that grows into a friendship, that's fine, but then you recognize that the nature of the relationship has changed. Because if you're looking to that person to meet your needs, it changes. Okay? And that's what happens in a friendship. So in a healthy relationship, your own needs, you make sure, are taken care of elsewhere, and you're not sharing stuff that's based on your own your own needs or the deficits or ego. What you're sharing is what fits with the situation. It doesn't mean you have to share everything you feel. Maybe you're very angry at someone, uh, but to share that at that moment may not be helpful. So I just scream that. It's like, look at what's helpful. And share what fits. It doesn't mean you just let it all hang out. It's always a process of clarifying and looking at the experience. And if you're doing these things underneath that, that's clear. Okay? You don't do those sorts of things with what you understand, listen, respect, and stuff. Because you recognize what you want to do. Okay. Joining means to connect or bring together. Okay. I also use the term join here as they use it in family therapy. And what family therapy, um, the way they use the term join is is to see the world from another person's perspective and be able to move in and out of that perspective uh, with relative ease. Okay. For example, a lot of times I'll work with um, one person and then later on in, this, in the treatment they want to bring their wife or husband or bring the family or something like that. And I always tell them, I'm going to join with that person for, this first, for the first few sessions. It's going to feel like I'm taking their side and that's exactly what I'm doing. Because if I don't see their side, I can't be helpful to the two of them. Okay, so it's really seeing their side, but it's but it's also discovering, in a larger sense, how we fit together and how our goals are the same. Okay, and developing common interests, developing standards that we believe in and goals that we work toward. Okay, it's creating a sense of community, and it's really the essence of solidarity. Okay, it's really coming together and standing shoulder to shoulder with someone. And I think when we when we when we start taking on this role, then we're starting looking at I think uh, what I would see as potential for long-term enduring social change in terms of changing some of the institutions when we can join side by side with people and, and have it based on our experience. And then the top step in terms of the role of helpers is to challenge. And this one in particular depends on these other steps being in place. If you simply challenge without the other steps, um, you might question whether you're being helpful at all. You may be more harmful than helpful. Um, and the challenge needs to fit with some, to some extent anyway, where the person is. If the challenge is overwhelming, there's a tendency to give up. Okay? The challenge means to arouse and to clarify. Okay? You get something moving with a challenge. Okay, it means setting a realistic goal and some real clear steps toward reading, reaching. So it's not some obscure thing way off in the distance somewhere, but you see a sense of how to get started and where you want to go with it. Okay. But it's not necessarily gentle. Okay. I was in an uh, improvisational theater company in my 20s, and um, the, uh, we were at a rehearsal, and the, the director told me to go out just by myself on the floor and improvise being hopeless. Okay, just, he said, just get into feeling hopeless and do whatever you feel like doing, moving or talking or saying anything. So I was just silent and just kind of wallowing in this feeling of being hopeless, and just, you know, just giving up and rolling around and doing these hopeless kinds of movements and, and just getting deeper and deeper into it. And then he said to this um, woman who was in the company, to go out and respond to what I was doing. And the woman that he sent out was, was a small person, but she grew up on a farm and she was strong. She was a strong person. And I was on the floor at that time, just kind of you know, reaching up and all of this stuff. And I thought to myself, she's going to pull me up. She's going she's to 
lift me up and pull me right up. And what she did is she came right over and she sat. <laughs> and I just collapsed on the floor, okay? And then she got up and I started to get up and then she leaned on me, okay? And she just pulled all her weight on me, just leaned on me, okay? And there was nothing I could do but respond to her weight. Otherwise, I was just going to go flat on the floor, okay? And as we continued the improvisation and responded to each other, the end of the, of the piece was that I was lifting her way up above my head, okay? But it was that challenge, it was that weight that was on me, okay? It wasn't what I wanted. I wanted someone to come and save me, pull me up, okay, and take care of me. But it was just the right amount of weight that I could respond to it and react to it. Okay. So that's what that challenge does. Okay. It arouses the person. It, it helps them to find their strength. Okay. It doesn't whip them into it, okay, but it, it's, it not so much forces but allows them. Okay. It sets the conditions so you dig into your boots and you find that strong part of yourself. So there's an encouragement with it, okay? But there is a demand, and the demand is stressful. So there is a stressful component to the challenge, and it's something that without these steps, you can be way off based on, okay? But to the extent that you accept, respect, really listen, and understand where someone's coming from, have some shared experience with them, and join with them, then you can challenge them in a way that's really important. So that's the role of helpers in the empowerment process. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay. Hey, a question or comment is, sometimes at hard times, like listening and understanding, some people will come back and say, what about doing a meeting? I'm one of the coaches. I just call it a coach. I go like this, and cut them out. In other words, it's too much but noise for everybody to hear, especially for secretary to take a book for it. Sometimes I hate doing that. I used to walk up to a person and like if you were talking to her, I'd walk up and stand next to you and if Bob see what I'm doing, first thing he's going to say, you want to run this meeting? Now you want to talk to me in the meeting. That's the way I look at it. That's the way I feel. If you're going to, you're here to learn and like understanding, you can't understand what's going on if somebody's going to be talking around me and over you. And that's just, it's a hard job to get into. But it does help, and we do have people who sometimes they get out here. I don't mind them talking, but if they get a little above it, someone else, no one knows what's going on. So Pat kind of plays the role of sergeant in arms during the meeting. Because there's, and we have to find a balance with that, okay? Because people need to talk with other people when there's someone brings up a proposal they haven't heard about, okay? You're going to talk to your friend about it. So what do you think about that? I don't know. There's something about that, okay? So we have to allow that, but on the other hand, if you've got 80 people in a meeting and everyone's talking, then no one is listening. So, so we try to find a balance with that. And as our, as our balance finder he does that signal, then the question is to the person who's making the most noise, do you want the floor now? Okay, you've got something that we, that we can all hear because clearly we can't hear anything. Sometimes they do, and, but it's just a reminder that it's part of the process. You just have to deal with it. Any other questions or comments in terms of the role of helpers? So how do we do this? How do we become an effective helper? And actually the title to this is not how to become, but the process of becoming an effective helper. As soon as you think you've got it, that you're an effective helper, you probably lost it. Okay. Um, you never get there. It's a process. You're always improving on it. There's always something to learn in this, and every situation is different. Okay? So it's not a question of, okay, I've got it now, I can handle any situation that my way. It's a continuing, evolving process. And once you start improving, you start going back the other way and becoming less helpful and less helpful. So you never really get it. You can't get a master's degree in being like that. You continue. You never master it. You're always working on it. There's always, there's always new challenges for always a situation that in hindsight you could handle more better. Okay? And the bottom line is balance. Okay? Without that, um, everything else is more difficult. Like I said, you can dip into your socks now and then, um, but um, it's a lot tougher. And you miss a lot. And you wind up giving
diminishing yourself as well as the people that you're trying to, to be helpful to. Uh, so the real key is to recognize when we get a little bit out of balance. Okay, because if we wait until we're that much out of balance, then you really have to pay a price to, 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 uh, to deal with that. Um, and it's a physiological thing, okay? Uh, the, the response to long-term stress, the body's response to long-term stress involves over 1,400, 1,400 physical and chemical changes, okay? The whole chemistry of your blood changes in long-term stress, okay? Your whole body is geared up toward action, toward fighting or running away, or toward, it's building up tension and all this energy that's geared toward doing something, not toward taking the information or being receptive. Um, so you really do diminish yourself. Okay? You burn yourself out. It's wear and tear in your body. There's a cost to it. Okay? A couple of really simple things, and we can spend more time tomorrow if you want more detail on it, but some things that help uh, in terms of maintaining balance. One is to simply bend your knees a little bit. Or if you're sitting down to press your feet down on the floor. Now this sounds real simplistic, and it is simple, but the reason it works is because Remember, the stress response involves tension. Okay, and if you like, I can go into this more detail. Remind me tomorrow about exactly how it works in terms of how our nervous system starts the tension process. But there's always tension when there's stress, and the tension has a pattern, and it's always up. We tense up in response to stress. Okay, and if you took a slow motion picture of someone increasing their stress, we'd see some variation of this thing. Okay, you always tense up. You don't tense down. And you become uptight, you don't come down tight. Okay? And the muscles tend to work as groups rather than individual. Okay, I've taught mine, and, and if someone is really tense, you can't isolate the muscle to do a to do a like a fine movement or something like that. Okay? And I've done exercise classes where I want someone to do this movement, and if they're in a lot of tension, they do this. Okay, so the whole body works as a whole under tension. Okay. If you bend the knees, you break the pattern can't tense up. Okay, it's, a, it's a concept from bioenergetics, and it's called grounding. And it literally and figuratively puts you on the ground. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Another is we can practice this tomorrow if you like. Taking this further, gravity helps my body to let go of the tension. Okay? And then I come up slowly. If I try to tense up in this position, I'm going to fall on my head. <laughs> so my body won't let me do that. Um, so that, that's another way to do it. Another has to do with how we breathe. Okay. Slow, deep breathing. Okay, it's the movement of the diaphragm that we're after. And what happens under stress is the part of our nervous system that charges up our muscles gets turned up. The part of our nervous system that handles our digestion and all the body processes gets turned down. It's either or on these nervous systems. Okay? And when you breathe with your diaphragm, and that diaphragm is the muscle at the bottom of your lungs and it moves up and down in a slow, easy rhythm. When you breathe in that way, it turns on the part of your nervous system that handles your digestion and is the relaxing part of your nervous system. It turns off the stress response. Okay? So another thing I do when someone's in my face and getting really angry is I'll go, and I'll make sure I'm breathing and I'm turned on. Okay? And it helps me to, to maintain my balance. Meditation is another very valuable thing in terms of clearing away your preconceptions and learning to let go. Um, okay, we've talked a lot about balance. The next step is openness. Okay, um, this is a challenge because it can be very uncomfortable to open ourselves up. Okay, and part of it involves looking at ourselves in an open way, looking at our faults and our weaknesses, as well as what our strengths are. Being open to our own feelings, being open to other people's feelings. So not suppressing our own emotions and not doing anything to, to induce another person to suppress their emotions. And when we do that, when we suppress an emotion, we suppress life. Okay? And we diminish ourselves and another person. Okay? And I talked quite a bit about emotions, so I won't, so won't go back into that again, but it's a simpler process of accepting it and letting it go and be open to experience and being open to, to, uh, to new ways of looking at things, being open to, to
to new situations, to, to different ideas and different concepts, and being open to, to looking at our weaknesses and our limitations. Okay, without openness, there's no vitality. It's the opposite of openness is closing. And in the process of closing, we use tension. And that diminishes our energy and our vitality. Okay? We violate our own nature when we close ourselves up. On the other hand, you know, if you're constantly open, you know, it can be chaotic. I mean, you, you have to, you know, come to some conclusion. I mean, someone once said a constantly open mind is like a constantly open mouth. Okay? It's a little, a little uh, frustrating after a while. But a, a healthy openness has kind of a rhythm and a balance, okay? And so you take in information and you make a tentative conclusion and then you test it and you check it out, okay? And you confirm it or you refine it or redefine it in a different way. Um, and it, being open doesn't interfere with having solid values and beliefs. Because when you look at a solid value and belief and question it, you strengthen it. And you realize its importance to you and you realize how it works for you and, and what it means to you. Okay, so questioning those things is not a bad thing. If they're really valid, they'll stand up to the question. If our minds are fixed, we don't get any new insights. And we just apply that fixed, objective way of looking at things into a changing reality and it tends not to fit. When our hearts are closed, we stop feeling. Okay? When our arms are folded, we keep other people away. Okay? So we need to open our minds. We need to open our hearts. We need to open our arms. Okay? And that's what helps us to become effective in the power process. Flexibility. We need to be able to bend to adapt to new development situations. It's a constantly changing world. It allows us to move. Okay? And bending is different from breaking. Okay? Bending can go a long way. It doesn't necessarily snap. It means you adjust, you adapt. Okay? You cooperate with events rather than trying to force them or resist them. Okay? And bending, sometimes even in the slightest amount, can, event, can prevent a breakdown. Okay? And if you look at how, how in... Um, California, how some of the buildings are now being designed to allow for earthquakes, and in Florida, how they're being designed to allow for hurricanes. They bend, they flex. Okay? So rigidity stops the helping process. It diminishes the people who work with them as a message, it diminishes their dignity, and that they're not acceptable. Flexibility communicates trust, it makes sharing and working together a lot easier. Inflexibility sends a message I'm right, you're wrong. Put you down. Okay, puts distance between us, diminishes my ability to help you. Okay, so flexibility means letting go of whatever doesn't fit in this situation. And I may have something that has worked for 20 years, but if it doesn't work here, it's not of any use to me. I may need to be ready to move on with that. Okay, so being <coughs> flexible isn't like a leaf that's blowing in the wind. Okay, we just fly in any different direction. Okay, it's more like being a well-rooted tree or sapling. Okay, and it flexes and gives in response to wherever the winds are coming from. So it doesn't mean you don't have any solid values or belief, or that you're just floating anywhere off in the space. It means that you're well grounded, but you move with the situation, cooperate with events rather than trying to make them happen. Okay, it's the opposite of rigidity. Rigidity means holding, it means tension. Okay, and when you apply a force to a rigid Structure, either the structure breaks or the force breaks. Okay? But a flexible thing is a cooperative back and forth situation. Okay? So it means getting your feet down on the ground and it gives you a sense of security. Okay? There's more strength and flexibility than there is in rigidity. Okay? So when we're flexible, we can respond to the power that's inherent to the people that we're talking with and that, that we're working to help empower. Okay? And then they find that power. And it grows. Okay. And patience. If we're not patience, patient with the people that we're helping to empower, if we're not patient with ourselves, if we're not patient with the systems and the structures that get in our way, um, then we miss out a lot. We increase our frustration and diminish our ability to help. Okay. I really believe that improvement is a natural process. I believe that when I'm in a counseling situation or any time I'm working with another person, that there is nature on my side. And our basic nature is to improve. Anything in nature improves. Okay, the whole natural selection process is a, 
is a description of how nature improves itself. Okay? Um, but nature evolves slowly. Okay, you can't plant a flower and make it grow faster. Okay, it's got to go through its own cycles and its own timing. Okay? Hurry, pressure, and, and, and impatience undermine the healthy relationship. To the extent that I'm in a hurry or impatient with someone, I've missed the boat with them. It just leads to frustration and leads to disappointment for everybody, myself as well as the people I'm trying to help. Um, it's, it's easier to become patient with someone if we see things in the larger context. Okay? If, we, if we look at the situation, like for example, someone's angry at you, if they respond to that real specific thing, which you tend to do when you're out of balance, it's a lot easier to lose your patience than if you're able to step back, figuratively anyway, and see what led to that, and see the sunburn. Then, so clarifying leads to patience. Okay? Patience is connected with tolerance and keeping our composure and following through with things. Okay? And it involves accepting our limitations and setbacks and looking at opportunities for improvement in our own struggles. Okay? Because being patient with ourselves is a real big part of this. It's not something you can just snap and, and all of a sudden empower people. Continual learning and a feedback process, and we probably need to be more patient with ourselves than we do with the people that we're working with. There are no wasted moments. Kim? I just wanted to say something about patience. Um, I have to be real patient sometimes as a coordinator. Um, if I look at the big picture of where I want to see these people down the road, I'd like to see them be managers in a business or you know, at least have some management skills. And I could get real frustrated real easy, except I have to be patient and see the little tiny baby steps that the people are making. Um, uh, we, one of our coordinators um, runs our exchange table, and she, um, she, our exchange table is something where they can exchange goods and services and barter rather than have to go out and buy something new. Or you can, like, babysit for somebody if they'll take you to the store. You know, you exchange services. So anyway, um, uh, this person who runs it, sometimes um, it, it's difficult for her. It's a new position for her. And if I looked at the big picture with her, I could get real frustrated and think, oh, it's just not the right person for this job. And, you know, but... I'm seeing some little tiny baby steps she's making that she really is growing and um, probably any of you, you know, if, if you have clients, that you can really appreciate those little baby steps and um, acknowledge those to the people as, you know, that you see the improvements that they're making and then that makes them want to jump a little further ahead so that they can, um, because they got that recognition. And, and if the elders can keep this quiet, not supposed to reveal until our third anniversary, but this person has been nominated to be our most improved patron mm -hmm. this year. And it's some of the person that Jim was talking about. And it's someone who's been with us from the very beginning and really didn't make much improvement at all in the first two years. She was in the program and then there's something connected with her. And she's been making a lot of improvements and doing a lot of creative things. You know, doesn't have the whole thing efficiently managed like someone would if you hired right out of college or something. Actually, they probably wouldn't either. But they'd have to learn on a job too. Um, but she's improving and moving ahead. Okay? So what patience means is being comfortable with the moment. Okay, that there's something here right now that's valuable, important, okay, and not being in such a hurry to get off into this future where they think they should be, okay, and, and, and all of this stuff. There's no wasted moments for a, for a patient health. Every moment is momentous. Every moment has an opportunity has something that we can learn from and gain from. Okay, if we can slow down enough to get into balance, then we can take advantage of it. Humility. I've referred to this a number of times, and we may want to go a little bit over time, so I'll touch on these and pick up on them again uh, a little bit tomorrow. Um, humility, Thomas Merton describes humility as our greatest strength. Okay? When our ego gets in the way, and our ego is kind of this little movie that we're making of ourselves that says, well, how am I doing here? You know, how do I sound here? Putting on a good show. To the extent that we're watching that movie, we're not paying attention to what's going on in front of us. Okay? It just takes us away from the reality of the situation. 
okay? And we can spend our whole lives making these movies and bringing in all kinds of stuff to build up these movies and all kinds of special effects and things like that that really have no effect on the work that's in front of us. Okay? Humility is ultimately reality. Our past accomplishments and this, this ego movie that we build up, uh, this fixed picture of ourselves distracts from happening what's happening right really now. When we're focused on our ego, we're separating ourselves from the other person. Our ego is our individual picture of ourself. So that the strength is in the community, is in the large group. Okay? And if we've got our sense of self on the line and what we accomplish, that's a conflict. And it just takes us away from it. Okay? And we're going to be more reactive and we're going to judge according to that. We're going to judge other people and it's going to set us up. Okay? So to the extent that we can embrace humility and let go of that sense of ego, we become a more effective helper and a more empowered helper. The next step is faith. Okay? I think faith in God helps a lot. It gives you some strength and some focus. But also in this terms, I mean faith in terms of trusting and believing in people. Okay? Even when you don't have any evidence that they're trustworthy or believable. Okay? Giving people the benefit of the doubt. And what happens when you do that is eventually they start it turns into a self-fulfilling prophecy. It doesn't mean that you give all your money to someone that has recently stolen it from you, but, it, but in a very real sense, you demonstrate that you believe in someone. Okay? And the only way to have faith in ourselves, which of course we also have to have in this situation, is to be ourselves. And if we're trying to be something else, or, or put, put across an image of being something else, then we're not ourselves. Okay? We lose that sense of faith. So if we try to hide our faults and our mistakes, we show others that we're hiding something, we're hiding ourselves. This leads to separation, mistrust. Okay? But when we trust and believe in ourselves and we trust and believe in another person, we set a standard for them. And we set a standard for ourselves. Okay? And it becomes easier to live up to that standard. Okay? It's real difficult to be confident if nobody believes in us. Okay? So this faith is having a belief in someone. It's a choice. Okay? And I think hope germinates out of faith. Okay, doors begin to open and opportunities and possibilities become realized as a result of this. So it's a choice. It's something we do. We choose to have that faith in our fellow people. And the top of the steps is wisdom. And Thomas Merton defines that very simply as the ability to see things as they are. And that means right now in this situation. It means to know and to understand right here and right now. So we can't store up wisdom for later use. Later use okay? We can't get a degree in wisdom and look up in our wisdom book and figure out how to deal with this situation. Wisdom means having a grasp of this situation without having to look it up. Okay? And that involves presence. Okay? And it's based on in the other steps in terms of related to understanding. Without presence and understanding, there can't be any wisdom. And true wisdom, wisdom is always humble. We recognize how shallow our understanding has been as we understand more deeply. So as soon as we start to think we've got a handle on it and that we know everything, um, drop down to this step again because you've just lost wisdom. Okay. Um, it has to be humble. And of course, when we see things as they are, we see what's needed. We see what's available and we see what's possible. And then it's just a matter of connecting those things. We're in touch with what's going on. Touch with, with what can we have. We cooperate with forces rather than trying to inflict our own opinion and judgment in, in, when we're using wisdom. Okay? It's gentle, it's easy, and it's elusive. Okay? You can't grasp it or stay with it. It's always changing, so you move with it. Okay? And thinking that we're wise is the quickest route to ignorance. Okay? It's, it's the best way not to be wise is to say, hey, all of a sudden, you stop being good. Okay? Um, you can never attain wisdom. It depends on each situation you encounter. It's never based on yesterday's information. It's based on right here and right now. So I may be very wise in this moment and very stupid in the next. Okay? Doing exactly the same thing. Okay. Um, that's the, the first two sets of, of steps that form the basis 
uh, for these four basic principles that we talked about earlier, the role of helpers and becoming effective helpers, again, each one builds on the other. Are there any comments? Uh, again, we can spend a little bit of time on this tomorrow morning again. Any comments on the helping process and establishing uh, an empowering relationship? Yes? Is there any, uh, is there at any point, uh, is it helping you to be steps and then you stop and say okay where are we now and then what may work and if my goal and objective is to get to this chair okay I may have a big obstacle right there and the easiest thing I can do is move over here and go over here and I have to walk and go around this way a little bit okay and ultimately the easiest way to get to this chair might be right around here okay and I'm standing here and this is my objective and I'm beating on things and trying to get there and I never make it okay um, so I think using an incremental approach. Now we do, of course, challenge people. So we put demands on them, and in a sense, we set a goal. Okay, you're the coordinator for this position, and it's up to you to create it, and develop it, and to make sure that it's, it's done. You're the records coordinator, so we need the minutes every week, and we need our history updated, we need the list of decisions updated, we need the hard times dollars put on the computer so everybody knows how much they have next week. So there are specific things and every um, we tend to use the term priorities rather than goals okay what's most important right now and so a coordinator fills out a form every week to list their priorities and they number them and then they list any obstacles those priorities and other things and it's a way that they can communicate you know with the elders and things like that because we copy those and distribute them um, <clears throat> but in terms of setting specific objectives we tend not to do that I think in some ways that's diminishing. I think that my experience in places where we've had to do that with people, I tend to do it in a real informal way and ask them, you know, what would you like to accomplish and where do you want to go in a general way. But when you start getting too specific and measurable where the accountant's likely to be, um, it, you lose your sense of the calm. Because a lot of times it's a question of figuring that out first. And if you're asked to do that, you know, at the very first time you meet someone, it, it sets up kind of a stress for it. The, the so I think, I think the concept of working with people when they're ready and, and matching it to where they fit uh, makes a whole lot more sense to me. So it doesn't mean you never challenge everyone, but I think the incremental way of just, here's where I'm at, now what? Okay, and here's where I'm at, and now what? And I just got knocked back to here, now what? Oh, now it's clear over here. I think that makes more sense in working with disadvantaged people than saying, I'm here and by October 31st, 1995, I need to be there. Okay, and this is the way to go. Okay, and that's the way we had to do it when I worked in mental health. You had to set a one year goal, and you had to set objectives, and you had to say exactly how you're going to get each step. Objectives. And in my experience, it's important to do it. It diminishes the relationship because you're always. You're always asking yourself, where am I on this goal? And, and the whole process is geared to defining that instead of defining the relationship, which in my mind is the most important. The relationship is everything, I think, in, in the involved process. And all those other structures just make it easy to keep track of so. Any other comments or questions? Others? Okay, tomorrow is 9 o'clock. Oh, okay. Okay, um, I realize that we're a small group here, um, but I thought I would give you um, some ideas on what you guys can do tonight to collect grantees and stuff. Um, right here in Clare County, well, right here in the in the hotel, they have a swimming pool and a, um, a whirlpool. 
Um, we also have some restaurants, some small town shopping, um, things like Berkeley Press Road, there's a place called the Leprechaun Shop. They have things that are imported from Ireland. Um, it's a really nice place. Um, and also directly across the road is a movie um, place. And I'm not sure, but I think it's the movie that's playing is um, Clear and Present Danger. Um, also, we have Mount Pleasant, which is about 12 miles down the road to get on the expressway, go back south about 12 miles. Um, that's our big shopping area. Um, we have Walmart, Kmart, Myers, um, JCPenney, and I was going to say, I think Target is now open, but don't quote me on it. It's either open or it'll be open next week. I can't. Um, they also have movies, a big movie theater down there with four or five movies playing, um, dinner places, and we have an Indian reservation down there. They have casino, bingo, you name it, they got it. <laughs> and that's about 12 miles from here. Um, any place else that you like to think of? I was trying to kind of pick things that are close that you could go to and still find your way back to real easy. Um, okay. Downtown Daniels is another restaurant just right. in walking distance. It's downtown Daniels. It's on the next block yeah. over across the street. Yeah, right here, right here, across the street. Excellent. Decent prices. Decent prices. Yeah. The bad news about the theater is they just uh, raised their prices by uh, 25%. The good news is it's still only two bucks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not first class movie stuff. Um, went from a dollar and a half to two dollars. So we all finished it. Um, there, are, uh, there are lots of uh, walking trails and things like that. Isn't there are a trail along the way? There's a chamber of commerce right across the street in the last couple of months. Right. Um, the, we also have um, a small community college um, going toward Harrison, and we have Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant. Um, they have the libraries, and in case you're interested in what's in the, in the area, they would they have plenty of um, student mall type shopping. So. Uh, are there any questions left over from yesterday? I was just asking her if you had a hand on hand what the rate of participation is for the total disadvantage population. I guess you know, we're looking at it for like Lenaway County, and you know, I can you know, have a good look at what, you know, what the numbers are. I can look at the reports and show how many people are on assistance and on SSI or on Medicaid or whatever. If we don't engage that, I just wondered what, what you expect. We had uh, 300 people who were on general assistance, and I think there's about 880 cases. And you're looking at membership in um, the I don't have the data right in front of we're, we're averaging, we were averaging through last year about 100 people per meeting. We've been down um, in August, which you can get down because we have a lot of people leave. You know, we're gradually building up again. I think we were at 70 to 80 uh, last meeting. I think the total served. Some of the information on the, the sheet there actually needs to be updated because our we have a computer that was built in 1984 and it, uh, it loses things. It's, it's, it's sort of like a person when you get old, you forget things and <laughs> forgets things. And there are um, there's a month, at least a month of data that disappeared when that before that total was made. So it has to be re-entered in there again. So the, the totals are loaded. Um, we just began doing outreach again in September. We really did pretty much that spread. We did that for the first three or four months, and then everything else after that was very mild for the next two and a half years. Um, so, in a, in a, in a sense, uh, it probably would have been wise for us to do that because we didn't have the capacity. The capacity of the room was about 120 people, and we reached that and exceeded that. So um, I 
think that uh, <coughs> also as you get larger and larger, um, it makes it more difficult to facilitate the process so it's less personal. Um, I think I would rather see two or three programs than one program with 200 people or 300 people or something like that. Um, and we've had to, uh, to back up on some things. And that's a, that's a, we're always learning. Things are always changing for us. But with new people coming in, you know, they get oriented informally. Whereas with the beginning, everyone has a sense of what's happening. And we're coming in to, to back up and talk about, like, um, like the control and how that's really made. We had a, a group of graduate students from Michigan State come up and, and do some qualitative research. And one thing that was real helpful, they found, was the perceptions of control. Uh, and that gave us an indication that, that because the elders were setting the agenda, we were just kind of going on the way we were, but we need to now state at almost every meeting how decisions are made so everybody's clear about that so that it can be reinforced again and again and again because then we have the perception of the elders making decisions. But basically what the, what the elders do is set up what comes to the floor that night because there's so many people. Uh, when we had 20 to 30 people, we would just have an open meeting every week. But when we had eight people, it's hard to, hard to manage it. So, <coughs> I'm hoping that sometime today, and Gretchen is going to be here later this morning, that kind of a general discussion of what's worked for us and what hasn't worked for us and what may or may not work for you and kind of put all of our heads together and do some problem solving because we're not uh, we're not experts in this process I and mean, basically it, uh, we opened uh, within two weeks of general assistance being cut off and we didn't have any grand plan or anything like that. We're just moving incrementally one step at a time and, and in many cases flying by the seat of our pants so it's not like we have a established thing that anyone can just follow and plug in. It's something that we need to be redeveloped in those situations and principles that apply in a situation. So I'm hoping that we can have some discussion today about how each of you can do that in your own setting and to make it fit and, and work for you. Any other questions or comments from, from yesterday's discussion?
couldn't possibly be rated at level five, and you would start at a one or a two or something like that. Um, so we're going to reorganize that so those are clustered together because people have got the feeling that they're that they're being docked if they don't get fives all the way across. Whereas for someone particularly starting out at a job, they have to learn it, so they can't they can't um, their quality of work and their and their um, being organized and efficient and things like that is going to depend on development of skills. So we're reworking this form. Um, and then the other form is the weekly form that uh, is this form right here uh, that we just started using and the coordinators just simply write down the priorities for the week and the number them. And then any obstacles that are getting in the way of them doing their jobs. And then there, we ask them to budget the number of hours it's going to take them to do the job for the week. And then they also write in the actual number of hours. And then any notes or comments. We make copies of these and give them to the elders uh, so that everybody has a picture of what all the coordinators are doing and we're putting them in a notebook so, that, so we can look at that and track it week to week. Um, there's a number of reasons for it. One is, is as we're moving towards starting a business, um, we need people to, to be able to plan ahead and get a sense of how much time it's going to take them to do things and, and, and to start getting pretty good and pretty accurate at estimating the time because that's going to be the cost and the income that we have to balance all of that. So it's giving some experience with that and to, to begin to give people some budgeting experience and things like that. And also to, to set priorities so that the most important things are done first. And if there is a, a budget crunch, particularly when we're working to our business, if things are real tight, and there's a people some time, we can and do some problem solving pretty clearly and look at priorities and say, okay, well, this one, this one really has to be done. We can't get out of that. This one, we might be able to delay it. Like so try to keep things as efficient as possible. So that's the reason for these forms. And this is one of our earlier um, new patron packets. Those are the things that we need to do when come out where our, our uh, membership coordinators uh, put these forms together. And that's what we get off to the patrons. And this is, um, what do we hold off on this one? Because this is changing. That's the forms. Okay, so we'll just pass these around the table and we'll read them over. Any other questions or comments? to be approved by the people using like the coordinator team had to approve all of the forms. Um, sometimes sometimes staff will suggest the format. You did. And, like with the thing about the priorities and the obstacles and things like that, I suggested that but then it goes to the coordinator team and then they can revise it and approve it. Uh, the, the rating scale was pretty much developed uh, by the coordinators. I gave them a list of things to think about and then Kim sat down with the coordinators and worked all of that out, and they, they came up with that themselves. The coordinators also write their own job descriptions. Kim sits down with them, and they define what the job is and outline what they do. And each coordinator is, um, is setting up a notebook uh, that lists their job description and their duties, and it's a place for them to take notes and organize it. And then if that coordinator leaves, the next coordinator can pick up that notebook and get a sense of where they've been and what they're working on. It's a way to organize it. We're doing the same thing with elders. The elders have a notebook uh, that outlines what their duties and responsibilities are, and a place for them to make notes of any input from patrons and things like that, and then to keep records of what uh, you know, we discussed with elders. Gradually, we're just sort of Respond. There's not a lot of time for foresight <coughs> with the limitations that we have with staff, so gradually we respond to, to things and try to get them more organized and so that they run more smoothly. But uh, there's, a, there's a significant, it's, it's a, and that's one thing I wanted to talk about later on is, is as you look at programs to anticipate them, I think having two staff to run a hard times cafe or to serve as advisors probably isn't enough that we really need uh, some more people. I know when there's a teacher uh, who helps to run meetings occasionally, and she runs them by herself, but what we've worked out is running them together. And there's a, just a definite advantage in that, because 
one of us can always be kind of observing and seeing what's going on and, and picking up on kind of the energy of the situation and people's moods and another person is talking and you don't have to be thinking all the time while you're talking and trying to organize and keep things straight. But the process of running the meetings um, can be a little chaotic sometimes because um, <clears throat> you've got to keep two or three things in your head at the same time. Someone will make a comment, you need to clarify that comment and make sure everybody heard it. But you're talking about a proposal and someone will suggest changing the proposal and then there'll be another change to the proposal. And it's trying to keep it all straight and keep the discussion focused all at the same time and it can be confusing at times. So having two people to run a meeting really makes that a lot easier. Eventually, is a is a building and an office, you know, where people can come at any time during the week, and a store there where they can come at any time. Uh, but we just don't have the funds for that. So it opens at quarter to four and closes at four thirty. Uh, sometimes it's open in the after dinner if enough you know, people can get a chance to, to get on the meeting. Actually, it's kind of an advantage to have it open just one day a week. Um, it teaches everybody to plan ahead. They have to decide what they need what is most important, um, and to try to get it. Um, if, if they were to get a job, they would only be paid once a week, therefore they would have to they would have to do the planning ahead of time in that situation also. Yes. The little green form that we have, the handout, yeah. it has a phone number on there for information now. When they come out, who, where does that go to? That goes to the volunteer coordinator office. At DSS. Tina is the most likely to answer that. I see. So as an administrative coordinator, that's where she her desk is. Well, if we if we had an office, if, if somebody if somebody donated an office or a building to us that we could put our own office in, we would have it there. But um, the Department of Social Services here in Clare County has given us a lot of support. Um, not so much with staffing, although they they do support Gretchen's. Um, participating in it. Um, they support us with um, allowing us to use the telephones and the bag machines and the copy machines and the computer in her office. So it, it there really is a lot of support there because we do a lot of things there at the office. So basically then you in your position you would have the job at the bank. You you may have yeah. the um, paperwork. We're actually talking one point about um, a grant that was supposed to be and they're going to hire um, full time for the hours a pay. And I'd actually receive a paycheck. That's what I want. <laughs> and um, if, if we were to get an office, if we were to get a building with an office in it, I would probably, or whoever was in my position, would be the one that would be manning the portio and would get the office, making sure the phones were answered, whatever else you need to be looking for. Not for <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are some times that 40 hours a week is mandatory, um, and then there are some weeks, like this week, 40 hours would be mandatory. For this. Then right. there are some weeks when even 16 hours is too much yeah. because there's just nothing to do. Yeah. I find that true with the transportation down there. Yeah. Right. And sometimes there, are, no matter how hard you try to find something to do, there's just nothing to do, and there's no sense in getting paid for it. How about uh, from the model? Any thoughts on how that fits in your own situation and what your plans are in the future in terms of looking at empowerment? Uh, and primarily, we talked about the four basic principles and then the bottom part in terms of the role of helpers and becoming a helper. Uh, in particular, do you see any obstacles or difficulties toward trying to make that happen in your own setting? What would get in the way of that? Okay. Yes. I think our discussion yesterday about being ACT workers, a lot of times we're the adversary. I think your past when a certain group of people will affect it a lot. I find some of these steps would be really difficult mm -hmm. on both sides. What what specific steps? Let's let's look at some situations um, and see if we can do some problems on. Jesus, all of them at a 
certain situation, like with a, somebody that's uh, a real substance abuser, um, a lack of trust, um, having faith in someone. I think, uh, like you said, some uh, alcoholics and all that. But if you take a couple people and start going to these places, and kind of the other person will see that other person down the road, they'll, they'll act the same way. It takes time. Because when we first go, I would slop. Now, <laughs> they don't look too bad, I don't think. <laughs> but in time, People will go with it. Mm -hmm. It takes time. That's why. I think there's two real important principles that Dwayne just brought out there. The one that he just said is time and patience. That you can't go in and all of a sudden you turn something around. That, that you look at it as you always look to the long term. And what are the steps now to get you into the into the long term and where you want to go? And then the second principle was this also its patience right there and also the power of the community that doing it alone as a staff person uh, may be impossible uh, in terms of building that faith and that trust but if you can if you can begin with a few people and then get those people as allies and be kind of co-learners with those people uh, that, that, that sense of growing and building community has a power that no one individual possibly match. Okay, there's, there's a process of people working together. And the people who have been there and worked through it can have more influence on other on other um, participants than any staff person, no matter how trained or where you've been, because there's going to be a trust and a faith there that I could never get myself. Okay, no matter what I did, uh, I could do handstands and you know, suspend myself in the ceiling. Have the same impact as someone who's been right in that situation. So, uh, that's what I'm talking about. And, uh, and yeah. I just want to make a comment. I know with working like in Head Start with other disadvantaged families, that, you know, you may work out of the ACT office and this you might think is really good, but you can't make the people go. And if you open it up to the public, I would see that your clientele may not even be the same clientele. See, that's, yeah, I would guess that. So I wouldn't even fret that yeah. it's not going to work because of the clientele you're working currently with. And it just may not be a goal right now. And, you know, my, it's just a whole different, yeah. And I, I think you're right. We would, something like this, I think, would attract an entirely different mm -hmm. population. Like for ACT, a lot of people are, are court ordered to us, and that's not a real working relationship right now mm -hmm. at the start. And in the ACT program, we will still have to maintain the kind of relationships that we have, um, such as our policy of not seeing anyone intoxicated. Even if their behavior is okay and it's not dangerous or threatening, we still cannot see somebody in that condition. So I think it would be um, definitely an advantage if it was a different population. I think it would just be really hard to mix the two right now. Um, yeah, we have to follow like the agency guidelines. So if you use more vehicles, you know, that's an agency guideline. You know, that has been drinking the food, you know, we're not allowed to be in the car. And so that's, you know, even if we feel we can handle a situation for a day, you can't do that. You've got to follow the guidelines of the agency. I can see a real big problem if you're servicing the same group of people right. and they know these are the guidelines for this, and then for hard times, Oh, I can go drunk there. Right. You know, yeah. You, I, well, you but, do but nobody comes, I mean, very few people come right. back. Right. See, because of the power of that community. What we do is we turn it back to the patrons, okay? See, we, we get stuck as professionals to so think we have to solve these problems. Okay? Let yeah. me give you an example. Um, people wanted, this was early on, but now we have a list of things you can buy with hard times dollars that, that's pretty long, and, and I don't think we're going to add to the list because they've exhausted it pretty much, you name a necessity, and some patron has thought of it and got it discussed and voted on. And like I said, some things were turned down initially, and now they're, now they're approved, and the list just keeps on getting longer. But one of the early items was um, auto parts, okay? And auto parts can get turned into cash almost as easily as food stamps can, okay? I mean, and one thing that we guarantee the people who donate to our program is that 
that the vouchers won't be turned into cash, okay? That we won't have them get something that they can turn over into cash real easily. So here's a problem. People want to buy auto parts. They need to get their cars fixed. And the way DSS handles it is you send them to a, the most expensive, or if it's not the most expensive, it becomes the most expensive mechanic in town, okay? Who probably doesn't do as good a job as you could do yourself fixing the car, okay? And they fix things that don't even need to be fixed. Um, and then they, they keep the voucher system. Well, that, that is really convenient to people to send them to the mechanic to do something they can do themselves. Um, and I was at a total loss. What are we going to do about this? But here's a patron standing, you know, I need to get my truck fixed. If I'm going for a job, I have to have my truck, and that's legitimate. Okay? So I'm totally stuck, and I'm thinking I have to solve this. And, and the obvious thing that always comes up and that leads to the ultimate solution is we got to give this to the patrons. Okay? So I just bring it out. We've got a problem here. Okay? He wants to buy auto parts, but we've guaranteed the people that that they can be assured that you can't turn it into cash. How do we know? How can we prove to them? And I'm not saying anything about not trusting him, but we're talking about what people who are digging into their pocket and donating the program are going to believe. Okay? And we're dependent on them. And if the word gets out that someone is suspicious of that, uh, then we're going to lose a lot of donations. So how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? And so we spent a whole meeting discussing it. Okay? And the solution that came up was something that I didn't expect at all. I was trying to think of ways to, to make it accountable, okay, to make sure that, that we're not getting ripped off, which is basically how the legislature approaches the whole social services process, okay, and the mental health process and everything else. How do we make sure we're not getting ripped off? And that's a mindset that we can get stuck in real easy. What they came up with was an automotive committee made up of six people who know cars and trucks and how to work on them and what they're needed, and they provide a service. If anyone has trouble with their vehicle, the automotive committee, for free, will check it out. You bring your car in, if you can make it, if not, they'll go out to it. At least um, two of them have to, or three of them have to approve it, okay? But they put their heads together and figure out what's wrong, and they make suggestions on the best way to get it fixed. Dwayne is on our automotive committee, okay? So they'll suggest if it's better to buy a kit or whether it's better to buy used parts, and which auto parts store is going to give you the best deal on the parts, or whether it's better to go to the junkyard and get the parts. Um, and you can even work out a barter with them, and one of them will fix it for you. Okay? And in the process of that, they all also check your license and registration and make sure you own the car. But listen to the difference of that. Instead of an accountability thing, we're going to make sure you're not ripping off, they provide a service that meets the whole needs of the situation, and as an afterthought, also make sure that the parts are needed and they're going to go in their car. Okay? So when we get stuck, the solution lies with them. Okay? So what I would do in that situation is, okay, here's what we got to work with. If anyone is, is, is drunk, we can't put them in our car. Okay? And we're not supposed to be able to talk with you. But on the other hand, you still have some needs, even though you, you've fallen back and gotten drunk. Okay? What can we do about this? Okay? And the process of working that out, uh, even if they don't come up with a solution, the process of thinking about it is going to empower them. And it's up to them. Okay? It's not like, well, I've got to figure out a way that I can help you. It's we're in this together, and how can your needs be met? And we've never had a situation where they have to come up with a solution. I mean, everything has gotten worked out so that people's needs are met. We talked about it long enough. People have an investment. Their investment in resolving that is greater than our investment. Okay? I mean, when we first proposed, when I first proposed the Hard Times Cafe, when they first, in spring of 91, when they were talking about um, the first scare about general assistance, when they were just talking about it and thinking about doing it, um, mental health said, uh, I proposed it, the mental health run it, and they said, well, we can't give people transportation, so we just can't do anything for them. Okay? And that's the end of it. So we're, we're done. We have a reason not to. Okay? So as professionals, if we find an obstacle and there's not a way in our system to deal with that obstacle, that obstacle just fits there. Okay, we can't do that. We'll do something else. Okay. But that obstacle <coughs> is very real to the people in need. So if you present that obstacle to them and ask them for solutions, they're going to look around it. They're going to figure it out. Okay? And they're going to say, ha, we can take it apart this way and squeeze right in the middle. Well, here we go. Okay? Um, whereas an agency doesn't have the, the investment I think in many respects, the agency is invested in maintaining efficiency and meeting their standards and doing all of that. Um, 
So ultimately, I think there's a way to come together on that. So we say, here's the limitations that the agency set. Now what can we do about that to fit that? Okay. And maybe in that process, depending on, on the agency, you know, they can move a little bit. Okay. Maybe they're, and, and, and then that is really an empowering thing. Okay. Because then you've got people being clearly expressing their needs and, and getting it out. And you've got some ears that, that can listen to that and hear the rationality of that. And then you've got a, a feedback loop, which is missing, unfortunately, in, in many service, social service organizations. The direction of information goes one way. And there's not a, a loop where the, where the participants give back and talk about their needs. Um, in a lot of, question there I won't forget. In a lot of cases, um, in the case of somebody's strength and they still want to come and they know that you can't help them, if they know that, that this little community is behind them, um, it sometimes it inspires them to maybe not drink. If they know that they're going to come and they can't get in the car if they're good, they've been drinking, and they really want to go, they won't drink. It, it inspires them. It lets them know that there's somebody behind them willing to bend the rules or willing to make a new rule to stand behind them to get them where they want to go. And in the case that, I mean, I know that some of our patrons do drink, but they don't, they don't, you know, when they know that they're coming to hard times, they don't drink. Oh, no, this fellow will come right in on Monday morning and intoxicated. He knows the rules, and then we will say, you know, we just can't take you to it, and you know we can't do that. Well, when he sobers up, he says, you yeah, do that. Okay. But you think about, you see, you think about, and, and this is where we're going to go next, and the conditions for improvement, and the issue of control, it can change the whole atmosphere. If I have no control, okay, I can come in drunk and kind of control you a little bit. I'm going to yank your string a little bit, okay? Because there's nothing you can do. I'm breaking the rules and I'm here drunk. What are you going to do about me? There's nothing for him to lose. Nothing to lose, okay? I don't have any control anyway, so I'm going to get in your face a little bit and I'm going to get a little bit of control and try to get some sense of dignity that doesn't really work. So it's like a short-term fix, just like a drink is a short-term fix. I'll feel better for a little while and long-term, I'll say like that. Okay? So if you don't have control, you're going to go to short-term fixes. Okay? And I think that's a consistent thing that you can see uh, that's a temptation for a lot of disadvantaged people because if you don't have the resources or the control to do anything long-term or to build on, your frame of reference is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And if I can pull someone's chain right now, this minute, and get a sense that I have control, I'll feel better for a couple of minutes. And that's all I'm worried about right now. Okay? But if you turn it over, and now this person has some control, okay, and there's some decisions that are absolutely up to them, okay, and you may have to sort out, okay, this is the limit of the decisions we can give to these people, or there may even be parallel programs. I mean, there may be a parallel act team, okay? There may be a staff act team, and there may be a participant act team. And the participant act team may ultimately have more influence than the staff act team. But if they can work together and support each other, you know, then it can start to even out and work out. But when there's that perception of control, okay, and the perception is more important than the actual control, okay, you have to, you can have control and not think you have control, and it doesn't matter, okay, and control is intimately tied in with stress levels. Okay, to the extent that you don't feel you have control, your stress levels go up. And when your stress levels go up, you're building up tension and you're becoming defensive and you're, you're becoming less receptive and you're not going to be in a problem-solving mode, so you're missing a whole bunch when you start to lose control. And they've done a lot of research to confirm that. One of the, the, the most established things that they've done a long time ago is they took two groups of people, okay, gave them both an impossible task. The task could not be completed. It just simply wasn't physically possible. Okay? This group had no control over what they did. Okay? It was just clear that no matter what they did, it didn't work. This group, they gave the illusion that they had some control. They played a trick on them. They didn't really have any control, and it ultimately didn't matter, but they thought it mattered. Okay? This group had significantly less stress and tension than this group. So what matters is the perception of the control. Now, of course, that has to be real underneath if you're going to be honest with people. But the flip side of that is even if they have control, they have to know they have control. So you have to continually remind them, here are your choices. Okay? Now you're drunk, so you can do one, two, three, or four. Okay? Now, when you're sober, you can also do five, six, and seven. OK? 
Okay, but these are your choices right now. Okay, which do you want? Okay, so always the local control is is within that person. Okay, and as they get a sense of that, that changes the whole thing. Okay, there's a there's a there's a a feeling that you can touch when a group has that sense that they're in control. And we saw it in the first few weeks of the Hard Times Cafe when people really realized, hey, this is up to us. Okay? And it happened when we went down to Battle Creek when they opened a program that's, that's based on our model. The, the second meeting we went down there and people kept on asking questions, the same question in different words. What do you do when this happens? And how do you deal with this situation? And what's the rules about that? And we kept giving the same answer. Well, this is how we decided to do it in Clare County, but you're going to have to decide how to do it here. And then at one point in the meeting, it clicked. And you could feel the change in the energy in the room. You could sense it. And the enthusiasm just picked up, and people wanted to start working the next week. And why do we have to wait another week to have a meeting? Why can't we start doing community service work right now? Okay, these were people right out of homeless shelters who all of a sudden got energized because they realized it was up to them. Okay, so that it's it's a, it's something you can you can feel and you can touch when you have that sense, and it's something you can feel and touch when you don't have. Because when you don't have any control, it doesn't matter what you do. You just go through the motions and so on. Okay, turn this way. Okay, I'll turn this way. I'll turn that way. Okay, I'll turn this way. I'll turn this way. I'll turn this way. I'll take it back to the way. Okay. I'll and you just kind of give up, okay? And you take little shots whenever you can to pull someone's chain or to get some sense that you have some control because control and dignity are intertwined. You take away someone's control and you don't have any dignity. Okay. Um, our very existence is in many ways dependent on that sense of control. I mean, our existence as a society. Uh, if you look at I mean, last summer, they were talking about the, the anniversary of D-Day and what led Germany to lose the war. And there was an eminent historian who pinned it down on one single factor, and that was control. That we would have lost the invasion of Norway. We would have been beaten back into the ocean if the German soldiers had a sense of control. If the people on the lines and the, and the lieutenants and the captains who saw what was happening could act without orders from above. But what happened is they had to wait for orders from Berlin that took a day to get down there, whereas the Americans who were, who were getting torn apart on the beach took control themselves, and they improvised. And they said, well, the plan is shot, so let's just do what we think is best. So you had one person in a group of eight or 10 soldiers going in and taking some actions where the Germans were totally frozen <coughs> until they could get the word from Berlin, and that took a whole day. That turned the tide of the war. And now we're in a democracy rather than under a Nazi occupation. I mean, it, it could have been that serious, and it was that fact that it made it. That, that the American soldiers took control when there was clear that the system had broken down. Yes? Another thing you said, like, they never returned something for cash. Like, we have a fairly large number of Yeah. 
that's one big difference, and that's one of the, the things that we're going to get to in the process of improvement is that people need to work at something. We need to have some sense of being productive, okay? And so finding something that someone can do so they feel that they're useful and productive, okay? When you have a mindset that you're leaning on the system, okay, you're going to try to take that system because you're never getting enough, okay? It's never been tested to give people enough to get by on to see how they respond, okay? Because we always just give them never enough, okay? And those people so, who do go to work, they get their exercise, it's cut. And yeah. Every $2 they make, they take a dollar, and then their rent goes up so much that they can't really afford to pay it, so then they want to quit work. Right. The system, the, is system not, is the system is not geared to help people. And our conclusion when we started the Hard Times Cafe is we didn't have the power to change the system, because the only way you can do that is to have probably $70, $80 million. Um, and we didn't see that coming in the foreseeable future. <laughs> so so our, our challenge was to work within the system, so we set up this point system, hard times dollars, so they can earn the vouchers without messing with their SSI or their grants. Okay? And that flew. We were real fortunate that they did allow that. But, so that's why we set up the alternative economy. They earn the voucher for an automobile car, say a carburetor. They don't want to pay the carburetor. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, they don't want it. Can they return it to that product store and make money? Um, we, have, we have made arrangements with the stores. Um, if, if I were to go, first of all, we have to go and get um, an estimate, find out how much the part costs. Let's say I, I deliberately got a part that's more expensive than the one I'm going to need. If I go and get the part and I'm supposed to get three dollars back, that three dollars they put in a check and sent back to Part Times Cafe. We do not see the money. If we return the part, say we decide that we don't need it, that money goes back to Part Times Cafe. We do not get a refund. It goes directly back to the place that we bought it from. And on the receipts that we get, it usually says Hard Times Cafe. It doesn't have our name on it. It says Hard Times Cafe because that's who's paying for it. And we're, we're earning the money, but Hard Times Cafe is the one writing the check. And when the money comes back to Hard Times Cafe, um, they decide, you know, they, the money goes back into the account, and then we get ours back also, our, our point system or whatever. It's, it gets kind of complicated, so most people well, don't want to do that. I was thinking of, you know, they don't, we don't get the money. I could just see him walking into, if he purchased it from you today, go into a different man at the parts counter, because he doesn't get the same salesperson, and try and slip it by, I want to return this today. We have a contract with each one of our vendors, okay? And so they they know uh, mm -hmm. that, and basically you're going to need a, uh, I don't even know if they get a receipt. Yes, they, they do get receipt. receipts, and it says hard times get right on the top of them. Oh, okay. It, okay. It, it actually, usually, when um, when you buy a part, or even most stores nowadays, because it's being written, it's being paid for by check, they write out the receipt to Hard Times Cafe and give it to us. If I were to go to Ben Franklin, which is a local store, and buy a pair of shoes, Hard Times Cafe sends them a check in advance. So when they write us the receipt for it, the name Hard Times Cafe is on the top of the receipt. In order to turn those shoes back in, we have to have that receipt. They automatically know that it comes from Hard Times Cafe because it has it right on top of the receipt. Um, we we make sure that they yeah, do that. That's the okay. yeah um, it's kind of we've kind of taken a page from the Department of Social Services when you buy clothes for the most program through the Department of Social Services they put right on the receipt DSS and that's you know if you have to exchange something or take something back it all goes back to the Department of Social Services we don't you know and it's kind of how it works with part time Cafe we've tried to make sure that even if they return the stuff. It, you know, you have to, and I have not been able to even exchange it for things without showing them a receipt. So the, the stores around here are real, it's real difficult to... And you see the patrons are clear about that too, because they know that one person who rips off the system will affect everybody, okay? So there is a community behind this. They want this clarity, okay? It's, it's, and it, see, you get a whole different mindset when you have an empowerment mindset versus a service mindset. You have a service mindset, a big part of that, and in some ways the biggest part of it, because that's the way it comes from the legislature, is we got to make sure we're not being ripped off. Okay? So we're thinking accountability. Okay? Remember the, the, um, the difference up here. We're thinking accountability, 
And if you change that mindset to responsibility, now this is up to you folks, okay? And if somebody rips off the system, we're all going to lose it, okay? They're going to make sure that system stays clear, okay? It's a totally different way of looking at things, okay? The way, and that's why I, I've tried to emphasize this concept of perceptions. How you perceive something makes all the difference in the world, okay? And you can choose your perceptions, okay? And that sounds kind of bizarre. Um, and you don't choose bizarre perceptions, okay? I don't perceive that, that I can beat Michael Jackson one-on-one -on -one in basketball, okay? probably never even would consider playing. Um, but you can perceive something about a relationship, and you can choose to trust someone, okay? And that if they fall down, then it was a temporary lapse and a difficult thing. And that sets that up. That perception sets up the, the parameters or the limits on how they're going to act, okay? But if I'm watching someone, okay, and I'm going to make sure they're not going to rip me off, Okay, their challenge here is, I mean, it becomes game, it becomes fun, okay? Now, how am I going to beat the system? I mean, look what people do with their income tax, okay? I mean, the more money you have, the more you can spend on, on finding creative ways to keep them paying income tax. You know, the richest people pay the few tax, fewest taxes, okay? Because they want to beat the system, because the system says, we're going to try to control you, we're going to try to, to do this, okay? But if you change that perception, Okay, we're in this together, and this is up to you. And if this falls apart, you're going to have to fix it. Okay, it changes the whole picture. I worked with a with a man once, um, and then uh, his his wife came in too. I worked with him as a couple. It was a referral from another therapist, and she said, "I've been working with these people for two years, and neither one of them is psychotic, but you'd think that one of them had to be when they described." A conflict that they're dealing with, because it's like one of them wasn't there, or both of them weren't there, because they described the same situation, the same conflict. I could remember the time, the date, the place. They were both there. They described it in totally different terms. It's like one of them wasn't there, and I don't even know how to begin to problem solve it, because they're talking about a different situation, even though it's the same situation. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And these people were married for 20 years really in each other's throats. I mean, they, it was incredible, their staying power to stay together through all of this, okay? Um, and in working with them and, and sorting it out, I shared with them that my impression was that they were kind of like a couple of dueling microscopes, okay? Because they had such a narrow vision of the same picture, you know, that the divisions didn't even cross, okay? And the woman eventually dropped out, she made some progress and decided, you know, I don't want to work anymore on this, this is enough, and I continued to work with the man, and he simply decided to change his perceptions of his wife, okay? He was perceiving her as out to get him, and out to diminish him, okay, and to put him down, and to catch him and doing something wrong, okay? And she was perceiving him <laughs> the same way, okay, so here you go, okay? Off to the races, you know, three times a week there's an explosion. On any holiday there's an explosion. Put them in the car together for more than 10 minutes, there's an explosion, okay? Um, he chose, okay, we spent a lot of time working on this and getting it to it, but he decided to perceive her as a person who was in pain and reacting to her pain. And I think that was quite an accurate perception. He didn't have any evidence for that, okay? He didn't have any evidence, well, we had some evidence that she had a very painful life, okay, a very, very difficult time. But he didn't have any evidence. The evidence is real clear. She was trying to get it. I mean, he could document that. Okay, he had to prove that in court. He could have proved it in court. Okay. But he chose to perceive her as someone struggling in pain and not out to get him. Okay. And within about a period of a couple of months, that just started to turn around. And now, they have quite a good relationship. It's very stable, and they're getting along. Quite well. <coughs> she never came back to treatment. Okay, he did that on his own. But just by shifting that perception, she stopped reacting to his reactions. Okay, you always have a circular relationship. There is no cause and effect in human relationships. It simply doesn't happen. Okay, it's virtually impossible. 
in a relationship issue to have a cause and an effect. You said this and it made you do that. Never happened. It's not possible. And that's a, that's a simplification of the process. That's objective thinking. That's thinking in terms of objects instead of living, breathing, changing human beings. It is always a circle. So some cause creates an effect, and that effect becomes a cause, and that cause becomes an effect, which becomes another cause, and they're intermingled. Okay? And all you have to do is change it one place in the circle and take it out. Now, it's a whole lot easier if you can change it two places in the circle and bring them together. Okay, that takes a lot less time and it's a lot less work. But all that's required is to change one place to break the cycle, to break the circle. Okay, so being aware that there's always that circle and then choosing to perceive it in a way so that you can get out of it, so you can keep it from cycling on itself is what works. Okay, so if I'm perceiving someone as they're going to undermine all of my efforts, okay, then they're going to continue to undermine all of my efforts. Okay, but if I can switch that and choose to perceive them in a different way, okay, and that, that was what I stumbled on in working with, with violent aggressive people and, and why it was, it was relatively easy to do that. I define those, those people as the healthiest people in the unit. I mean, I, I was asked to consult on a unit where there were three or four people acting out, and I found out that those people hadn't been outside in seven years. No one on the unit had been outside in seven years. And just about everyone else on the unit was clinically depressed. These three or four people were the only healthy people there. They were acting out and saying, you know, this isn't a life for us. I mean, this was in an institution back in the 70s before things changed about. But, uh, so when you start to look at someone differently, okay, but imagine looking at someone as a troublemaker all the time, they're going to give you trouble. Okay, so if you can redefine that, and that doesn't mean you mean acting out is good. That means this person has something to express. This person has a life force. This person has some energy. How can we channel that in a positive way? What can we find for them to do? In some cases, it was a matter of, of running up and down the hall with them and giving them a chance to burn out the energy. I, I consulted with a school in, in uh, Minneapolis where there was a young girl who was just exploding in the classroom every day. She was in a special ed classroom still, and they still couldn't keep her down. She was just bouncing off the walls. And I took her and ran her up and down the hall about 15 times. The guy got worn out. Was her boy. She would have kept on going for a long time. And I suggested, and she came back, and she was she was okay for quite a while. She started to tense up again, let's run her up and down the hall again. Okay? This was an incredibly high-energy young woman. She just couldn't contain that energy in that small little classroom. And I got a letter back from a couple months later saying, running her up and down the hall three times is all we do. She's really nice. She's really fine. Okay, she needs a chance to get not be okay. So if, if, you, if you try to look beyond the externals and perceive that person's such a choose to perceive that person's dignity and their dignity and their potential for improvement and focus on that and lock in on it, okay? Because it's real easy for our frustration to push us into the other direction and to say, yeah, but this person is this, okay? So that becomes a personal challenge. And that's why these steps are really <coughs> critical. And okay? we're going to talk about this the rest of today in terms of, and a lot of this really has to do with systems changes. Okay? If we can design systems that build this in. Okay? I mean, Hard Times Cafe has a system where the patrons simply have control. Okay? I can't change that system at this point. If I try to, it will lose. Okay? Uh, so it's structured in there. And we have to keep reminding them and, and reinforcing that. But the system is such that every, any single person has to control. Yes? It would help me a huge amount if we could, if we could cover those um, Okay. I would love to do that, and I do have a meeting at 4.30 in Traverse City, so... Okay. You want to move on? And if, yeah, if, you know, I'm one person, and, and the only one leaving early, but I, I've got so much out of the two bottom ones. Yesterday, I would love to hear the discussion on what you tell Okay. And I've been touching on many of these through it, but, yeah. but yeah, let's go ahead and, and uh, move through that. Um, well, I've been talking about control already. Let's start with the conditions. For improvement. And for me, that's the essential bottom line. Okay? 
without control, um, there's no empowerment. Okay? Empowerment means having authority over your own life. Having authority over your own life means having control. So to the extent that you don't have authority, you don't have empowerment. It's as simple as that. The idea of empowering someone by giving them a minimum wage job with no future and no benefits and no interest and no skills uh, is false. That's not empowerment. That's giving someone a low wage job with no future, no benefits. You don't get power from that. Okay, it's a dead end. Empowerment means having authority. And uh, the people from the universities have a half a dozen different definitions for what empowerment means. But if you look up in the dictionary, there's just a four or five word definition to give authority. As simple, simple as it can be. Okay, so that means giving up authority. Okay, and that's tough. Okay. This culture really reinforces people who take control. It reinforces people who control other people. People who control other people are successful by the definition of this culture and this society. Okay? The most powerful people in Congress, I heard of an interview, and this has nothing to do with politics, just a reflection on what happens, because you can see the same thing in both parties. Um, there was an interview with a colleague, a Republican colleague of Newt Gingrich, uh, who's likely to become the next Speaker of the House, and he says, he's a control freak. You know, I like the guy, he's my friend, we're in the same party, but he's a control freak, and he's going to control every single detail of the process when you become Speaker. Okay? And you can look on the other side, and you're going to see a control freak over there, because people who control gain power because they take it from others. Okay? But ultimately, they're not helpful. To the extent that you control someone, you don't help them. And that's why every, every single um, dictatorship and, and hierarchical situation doesn't hold. That's why the Soviet Union collapsed. And okay? the quote I read yesterday from Mark Lockhaven, it collapsed not because of the military threats. It collapsed from within because people had no sense of control over their lives. Okay? It didn't matter what they did. So the control is the bottom line. If you can't give up the control, you simply can't empower them. Okay? And control means making, yes? I was wondering, without the sense of community, can you work with like a small group of people, maybe, and empowering them by giving them the control? Or would you have to have the sense of community? And if you have that, uh, you know, like a hard time wouldn't you have to have some person that would have to connect all this to explain all this so you automatically have a person that would be an authority? You know what I'm saying? Um, you may have someone who's an advisor and who offers direction and suggestion, okay? And I've served that role here, but ultimately I have no control. The only control but I have... But I'm saying in the beginning. If in your beginning stages... Uh -huh. Would you start off as mentoring a few people and then bringing a group of people together, or because you would still be seen, you would still be visualized as an authority, even if you were an advisor. I'm visualized as an authority right now. Okay, one of the respondents to the to the uh, MSU survey, um, who was a new patron, said that I have control of the program and I make all the decisions. Okay, so we've adjusted to that so that. So it's very clear that people can can uh, perceive that that it is up to them. Okay, and I have to be very conscious of continuing doing. The only control I have is is logic and trust and truth. Okay, and now I have to be careful because I can think on my feet pretty fast and I can talk pretty fast. Okay, and there are a number of people who are disadvantaged who don't process information as fast as I do. Okay? So I have to be careful, and that's why we set up systems so people can call me on that. Okay? Because if I and it happened with an issue uh, last month, it happened with the replication process. Because I was I was feeling really exhausted, and that I had nothing to give to other counties, and that really we needed to focus on Clare County. And but people had a lot of investment in replication. Okay? So I was feeling there's no way I can do this. If you ask me to do it, I just simply can't do it. And I caught myself, and other people, team among them, caught me too, and said, wait a minute, you're pushing on this. 
okay? And I have to back up at those points, okay? I think that early on, there's a risk there. And you have to be in conscious of that. Yeah. In the beginning, you're starting to set up, you're going to be seen as a control. In the beginning, you've got to be real careful, and this one is a real key. Okay? And, and. So I was going to say, if you're going to start a program like this, I foresee in the beginning, you have to have an advisor, or you have to have someone to initially establish what you're doing. Then. Preferably more than one person. I think it's. I think that's another thing that I would do differently. Okay. Is trying to have more than one person in the role, so we can switch off. They would still be seen as an authority, especially in my community. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you need to set up situations where that can be tested. Okay. And through experience, that's happened. I, I, I tried for the first um, six, eight months. I tried to get a group process going. I designed probably five or six different kinds of group processes based on the, on the um, Fairweather model, because that's really what I had in my mind when we started the Hard Times campaign. The Fairweather model is a program that, that takes people out of mental institutions and they form their own households called lodges and they start their own businesses and they become independent and they do remarkable things. Okay? I kept trying to get a small group process going. I finally gave up okay? because it just simply didn't fly. But every time I proposed that and it didn't fly, that increased their sense of control. Okay? And I've made a number of suggestions that haven't flown. Okay? Some of them good, some of them bad in my mind. Okay? Um, I got a little bit careless at points and would throw out a suggestion because I was confident it would get modified. Okay? And like I, I made a really big mistake uh, before our auction. I threw out a suggestion, let's give the people who have been doing service from the heart a bonus because they've been keeping the program going in terms of the fundraising and things like that. And there's a group of about one third of the patrons that's been doing the majority of the work. So let's let's give them some incentive. And I, and I just threw off the top of my head, you know, let's give them a 25% bonus on the service from the heart. Okay, and it just flew through a past. Okay, uh, and that's a that was a, an unfortunate thing because I didn't look at the numbers before that, and that brought in another couple thousand points into the auction, and it didn't bring that exchange rate down, which was the intent. Okay, but people. Question. I mean, there was a history of people questioning things, and I would offer a suggestion that it would be modified. But now people notice that and see the consequences of that, so they're more likely to question it and modify it. So it's an ongoing process, okay? And it's done through experience, and you have to test it. You have to test it. I guess, you know, I foresee that even if you started this kind of program, there would be all kinds of drawbacks because of the, the number one. You're going to have a group of people, number one, getting them together, especially because I'm from an African American situation, because right away there's the, there's all this difficulty and things, you know, the walls. You think about the walls, there's yeah. the walls up there. So, I mean, initially it would be very hard to get the group together, number one, but number two, to give them control. First of all, you've got to explain the concept. In order to explain the concept, you would have to become that. Uh, authority, even if you don't want to be. You know what I'm saying? Initially, you're down the line, you would be giving it back to them. But would it last long enough for them to foresee that this is a benefit to them? You see it what depends I'm on how you continue with it. You have to, you have to keep this in mind throughout the whole process. If you skip over this, you start getting your ego involved, you become impatient, you lose flexibility, okay? um, you become less open, you get out of balance. I would say thank you. So when we did when we did the we went down about thinking this then their for their second meeting. Their first meeting they only had um, two adults and five children, is that right? So they didn't have much of a meeting, they just sat at the table and talked. Now the second meeting they had like sixty or seventy people show up and we were down there for this meeting. In the beginning, um, the the concept of Hard Times Cafe was described, you know, so I, I'm assuming that they and when they first came in like Bob said earlier yesterday, they all stood in line. You know, they were they were like cattle in a line, just waiting to be to, to be waited at. And then when they when they grasped the idea of what this was all about, I don't think you're going to have control for very long. They they were they were eager to take control to make suggestions. Um, one of the people said, "Well, why do we have to wait a week for work? Why can't we do something now?" The people who were supposed to be setting this up hadn't planned on it happening so fast. And I told them, we just, 
we haven't contacted places for work site yet. We had assumed that it would take longer for you guys to become involved. And people started suggesting cleaning up neighborhoods. Um, let's let's go, you know, pick up the local the local corner junk area where everybody throws everything. Um, the suggestions that were being made, they had made enough just from the suggestions that were being made, they had made enough points that we to be able to spend on a store. Their first, their first actual meeting, they, the people had earned enough points to, to spend on laundry soap, shampoo, um, toilet paper, you know, the necessities. And they picked up real quick that they were the ones in charge. It, you wouldn't be an authority figure for very long. You might, you might want to guide them, give them suggestions, give them a direction to look in. But um, once they catch on to what they're doing, they want that control. That's what's been missing, and they're not. It's not going to take them very long to grasp it and run with it. Um, Battle Creek had a hard time keeping up with the patrons that were there. I mean, these people had been working on it for six months. They thought they had it all planned out how it's going to go the first six months, and figured that the patrons would take over by then, and then they would, you know, they would go from there. But within the first meeting, they had far outdistanced these people that had been going, you know, that had been planning for months. They just immediately took over and wanted to do all of these things. And it did not take them long at all to catch on to what it was that, that was expected of them if they wanted to be in control. They made three decisions the first night. They just stopped to control. And, and these people all came from homeless shelters and soup kitchens. Better and that's women. how we got our better women. There was, yeah, um, better women there, was safe, there was women from safe houses and things in the local area. I, I mean, you're talking a downtown Battle Creek. Site. And these were these were probably 75 percent black. Okay. I went to the to two homeless shelters and three soup kitchens and a, and a domestic violence shelter and personally invited the people to come and shook their hand, just spent two minutes maybe with each person. Um, I probably invited 200 people to come when 65 showed up um, and just said basically the. the I was had some question about what was the difference between the culture with Clare County and Battle Creek because it's a different ethnic background, it's urban versus the rural and all of that. And what became clear to me in the first 10 minutes I sat through of the, the lecture at the homeless shelter was their big issue was control. I think our big issue was isolation. Control right behind it. Okay, but isolation was a bigger issue for Clare County because you can live out trailer and the movies and not seeing like the police okay because you told me I'm gonna be dead for more than one for a month. Um, in Battle Creek it was clear, no question about it, it was control. I mean these people were standing in line with everything. Okay? I mean it was simple for me to talk to them right down the line. And then they just automatically came and stood in line when they came to Hard Times Cafe and the first thing we said, no, oh, no, no, get out of line. Okay? And and every time you're communicating this, okay? So we served the meal to them. I mean, these guys were just, I mean, some of them yeah, just, just yeah, really got into it. Yeah, themselves also. When it came time for like, for like name tags, everybody had name tags the first night that they were there. Um, we stood in line and shook their hand as they came in. We welcomed them. Um, we were going to write the name tags, but there were so many people that we couldn't keep up. So we just laid out some pens and stuff in the area and said, okay, if, if you feel comfortable with the name tag, go for it. And, and they, it was great. I mean, the response was, at first they were kind of hesitant, well, you know, is, is it okay to do this? Is it okay to get up and talk to other people? Um, they sat in little groups at tables until until we, the visitors, went and started talking to them, and then they started mingling, and, and they, they talked to this person. Because they were afraid to make noise. And then when we, when we came up and we started talking, we were talking loud and we were laughing, and, and they got the idea that it was okay to be, to be. It's okay to be me, and I have a big mouth, so I talk all the time, anyways. And I, you know, so it, it was real easy to give them the idea that it was okay to say whatever was on their mind, and to to have an opinion. You know, that they're not here to listen to our opinions; they're here to form their own. And it was it was excellent. I mean, I loved it. I love traveling. If you guys start one, please invite me. I love to go to these. Just seeing the. The one at Battle Creek, we talked about it for weeks. It was it was just amazing. And when they come to our, they visit us two or three times. They come, they're open, they're honest, they participate in our meetings. You know, they give their opinions at our meetings. 
It was, it was great. That first night, did you have someone keeping track of the point system? Yes. That first night? Um, yeah, and we, um, they had volunteers that had cooked the meal, so they had their own volunteers. And they, they do their meal a little bit different than we do. They have round tables like this. The people sit down. They put the food in the center like a family. Mm -hmm. And then you get to serve yourselves. You get to take as much or as little as you want. Um, you know, your kids are there. You get to share a meal with your children. It's a real relaxed environment. There's nobody screaming or yelling at you. Um, you know, they, they have the meal and the dessert. And then the children go off and play. They have a nursery on there. It's set up with all kinds of toys and stuff. The kids get to go and play and have fun under supervision, and the parents get a chance after dinner to relax and express their opinions and thoughts. So then was that turned over to one of the patrons that same night to the point system? Um, the point system, we had um, somebody there that was, was learning. They had asked what it was all about, and we had told them in the beginning that anything, any comments they made that were helpful, you got a point for it, and at the end of that night you could spend it on a story, you know, we explained what the story was all about. They loved it. They wanted to take over immediately. There were people that were volunteering to be elders and people that were volunteering to um, be, as a matter of fact, I think we had three people put in for coordinator positions that night to try to get this going and off the ground. It was just, it was and, amazing. And I think that, that um, in talking with them, uh, because the staff were, were somewhat afraid that they would get overwhelmed, and they kept on saying to people, we have to go slow, we have to slow down. First, we have to set our goals and our principles, and then we can work. And it took them like four months before someone started working. And my sense is you need to be ready to respond to them. And forget about my plans, you know, the way Clare County did it, is we focused on goals and principles and stuff like that, because we didn't have any other options at that point. And we were started with an angry group of people who just get lost all their source of income. Okay? But those people hit the ground running. Once that energy turned, and it, it took about a half hour, the meeting was one hour long, okay, in the last half hour they made three decisions, and it was clear that those decisions were how things were going to be from now on until they changed their mind. Okay, they made, I don't remember all the decisions, one was a decision about what if we get too many people in here for dinner, how are we going to do that, and they had a discussion about it, and someone made a proposal, and, and then someone made a counter-proposal, and they voted, and the counter-proposal was Remember, so they remember what they, how they solved it? Children first. Yeah, they, they had decided, they, they weren't sure how many people were going to come and it can only um, fit 100 people in the room at a time and they couldn't figure out how to, how to feed everybody. They weren't so much worried about the food because they could always make more food, it was how are they going to fit everybody in. And one gentleman stood up and said, well if I see a family, a woman with four children come in, I'm going to get out of line and let her eat first. And everybody raised their hand said, that's a great idea, I'm all for it. So it was decided that the women and children would meet first, the men would, would hold their own little meeting outside or do whatever it was they were going to do until the women and children ate. And then they could come in and eat in groups until everybody had eaten, and then they could start the meeting. The other thing, let me finish my comment, because I'll, I'll lose it, and I'll remember that it's easier for me to remember your hand to hand it. I was just going to say. Um, an important part of that is to communicate that through every action. Okay. And we define leadership in the Hard Times Cafe as being a servant, okay. as being like a waiter. Okay. And I see my role as a waiter first. It's the first thing I need to do with the Hard Times Cafe. So I bring coffee around to every person. Okay. And they used to help serve the meal, but it, it's big enough now so it just takes me time to get around with coffee twice to everyone and there's not much time in it. Okay. But, and, and how that done is, is a real important thing. I try to be the best possible waiter I can be in serving that coffee, okay? Because that has a, a tremendous symbolic impact, okay? I am not the authority when I'm serving you coffee, okay? You know, it's, it's, it's coming up, and, and would you like some water? Oh, I'd love some water. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there you go, okay? Now, it's hard for me to maintain an authority and power over you when I've just done that, okay? That is not a power act. It, it undermines that. And, and, and any of those little symbolic things, okay? You notice someone has just finished their dinner and the, and the, the plate of, of lasagna was empty. You go up, do you want some more lasagna? Okay, and you're, on, you're just like a waiter who's looking for the best tip in the world, okay? And, and you're there responding to people and letting them know that your role is to serve, okay, not to control. That's totally different from the service perspective over time, where we have the control and we know what's best, and 
it's up to us what you do. Okay? So you communicate that in every possible way you can. You, you avoid the, the role of the authority. Okay? And how you phrase the feedback matters. Okay? Like if things are going into a direction, I mean, I always have to remind them, well, but you made this decision first. You want to make this decision because that doesn't fit the balance. You can change that decision, but what you're starting to say now doesn't fit with this. Okay? Or, you know, like there was a discussion about, um, let's just get vouchers to Myers and you can buy anything at Myers. Now, well, wait a minute. Okay? You buy fishing equipment at Myers. You can buy stereo equipment at Myers. You can buy virtually anything at Myers these days. Okay? What's the effect of that going to be on people who are donating the program? What happens if one somebody finds that someone bought a CD for hard times dollars of buyers? What's that effect that can have on our donations and our fundraising things? Okay, so you got to call people on that. Okay, and that's where this principle of balance is real critical. Okay, you've got to balance that feedback with the control always going back to the patrons, always going back to the people that you serve. I mean, they call this social services. Not social control. Okay, I mean, they could call it the Department of Social Control. <laughs> they should some days. But I don't think that would fly in an election. Um, Works for the employees. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it is a service thing, and so if you emphasize that service, you can undermine that authority thing. But it's a constant thing. Okay, and there's something that's going to come up with that. Um, Invariably, and, and I think it comes up more being a man, but many disadvantaged people and people in, in poverty have not had positive relationships with their fathers. Okay? And so as a man, I'm in somewhat of a father image, and I'm someone they can get angry at without hitting them, without abusing them, without cutting them off, okay? or showing disrespect to them in some way. So I'm going to get some of that anger just from that natural transference process when you work with, with someone who's had a difficult time in those relationships. Okay? So that's going to happen, and that's a constant um, challenge to deal with that and to recognize where that anger's come from and not personalize it. And for that, you just simply have to stay in balance. You can't, you can't. If the duck loses its oil and its feathers, it gets wet. <laughs> and you got to keep the oil in your feathers. So you can't just do one thing with the exclusion of this. That's why we went through this first. Because without that relationship, you can set up all kinds of systems and structures and rules, but without that relationship, without serving the coffee or the water or bringing your extra portions and things like that, you miss out on it. Yes? I guess, you know, I'm really having a hard time with it because I just think people are human and it would take an extraordinary advisor or advisors to begin the group because, I mean, you have to constantly be on guard of your own weaknesses, your own, you know, you your own mentality, because, you know, you're raised goal-oriented and you're raised in a society that, you know, wants to see productivity and results and immediately and I, I, I just, I guess, I feel, I don't know how the rest of you feel, but maybe it's just the way I perceive and receive information. But I just see a tremendous pressure on the person or persons that are the advisors to begin the thing. I think after the people have control situation, I think, you know, even then, I think it would take up extraordinary people, very knowledgeable people, very focused people, very balanced people, and how many of us really are that um, controlling of their own reactions and perceptions continually? And it's a learning, it's a learning process. It's, not something, it's saying, not something you It would can, be at the expense of them, you know what I mean? And if you make a mistake in those perceptions... But our service attempts are expensive <laughs> <them> too. <laughs> okay. It's a, it's a learning process. You never, you never ever get a handle on it. But, it. but I think it's probably, I mean, I've learned more in the last three years than I ever did in seven years of college. Okay? Probably ten times what I ever learned in seven years of college I've learned in the last three years of hard times campaign. If you really want to develop some clinical skills, start a hard times campaign. I'm going to force you to do it. 
Okay. I found out some things that, that what you talked about. But like myself, I said to people, we have a very small area. And I can remember that one day, I don't know, it seemed like it was overcrowded or something, for some reason, I had two plates in my hand, a baby sitting in there, throw it. I made my turn, somehow, got a little coat, and up the food. And that, in my opinion, it fell on the floor. I had felt bad about it my way, then I was worried about what would the mother say. I mean, if I felt something on your child, what do you react to? It wasn't perfect really, but some people depend on their mood. I guess you understood that it was too much in my way, because sometimes the table can be over too far or something. But anyway, I get nerved up in that way, saying with my feet, I made mistakes, but I didn't stop. I just kept on doing what I was doing. First of all, I cleaned up the mess. Joe kept asking the mother to stay the other night. They're going to they can't move when they have to. To me, that was an experience of how to control balance and hoping they understand that it's just an accident. We can help it to the market. They don't want that to get done, but over time, it's not. It's just something. I guess we all got a lot of understanding with one another up there. Some people we can't get through, but there's some we can. And that's just the way I feel about it. And certainly what you're saying, too. Okay. It's just the understanding how we work together and how things happen. Some things can happen perfectly, some can't. That's just the way I feel about it. And it helps you have it now. Roxy? Well, I know she mentioned that um, it's a lot for one person to take on. Well, I, if you remember yesterday, Bob was mentioning how stressed out he was a month or so ago. Well, him and Gretchen took on a lot by starting this. There really needed to be more people that started it. They would, between their outside jobs and working with the patrons and the paperwork, they've done wonders. That's what I'm saying. I just perceive this. There's so much, you know, you have to have... Number one, you have to have your store. You have to have your store set up, especially if they want to start right away. So that means you have to go into the community and market your program. And then you have to have people to do that. And so I'm saying, you know, I just think it's a phenomenal 